Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from here in Brussels at the World Customs Organization. Welcome to the joint launch of the study report on disruptive technologies jointly organized with the World Trade Organization. My name is Brendan O'Hearn, and I'm Deputy Director of Procedures and Facilitation here at the WCO, and I'll be your facilitator for the session. The, we have more than 900 registered people uh, participating in this event, and we do have simultaneous interpretation in English, French, and Spanish. The webinar will begin with opening remarks from Secretary General Dr. Kunio Mikuria from the World Customs Organization and from Director General Ngozi Okonja Uwela from the World Trade Organization. After hearing from the Secretary General and the Director General, the key findings of the study report will be jointly presented by Azam Soisanli from the WCO and Emmanuel Gan from the WTO. This will be followed by short presentations on the experience of deploying disruptive technologies from the customs administrations of Argentina, the Netherlands, Niger, and Korea. After these presentations, we'll have a question and answer session. With that brief introduction, I would now like to invite the Secretary General for his opening remarks. Dr. Migrodia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brendan. Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweara, WTO Director General, distinguished speakers and participants, I would like to warmly welcome all attendees who are interested in trade, customs, and technologies. We are living in the era where, thanks to the technological development, trade growth, including e-commerce, has significantly outpaced the typical public service evolution challenging our conventional way of doing business. This is the reason behind the WCOs taking up uh, this, uh, disruptive technologies as technologies. Those technologies disrupt the way customers conduct their business. The initial outcome of our efforts was included in the first study report on disruptive technologies published in 2019. Since then, the application of technologies in the private sector has accelerated partly because of the COVID-19 pandemic and that saw the expansion of teleworking and e-commerce, prompting more digitalization of border procedures towards paperless trade. Also recognizing that albeit significantly important Customs is only part of the international trade system. We felt the need to include a wider trade perspective. Therefore, I'm pleased that we are partnering with the WTO since early 2021 to get a more comprehensive review of where we are in using the technologies in global trade and its implication on customs. Conversely, and the extent to which customs leverage these new technologies to improve its process uh, can have an important impact on cross-border trade processes and supply chain operations. Hence, the two organizations decided to jointly assist our respective members' digital transformation journeys in a comprehensive and complementary and inclusive manner by bringing all relevant partners to the same table. Our cooperation has already resulted in the collection of surveys, results on the use of a particular disruptive technologies by customs and the development of a joint paper. The role of advanced technologies in cross-border trade, a customs perspective launched in March this year. Built on this partnership, Today, we proudly launch the WCO WTO study report aimed at providing a better understanding how the latest advanced technologies can help customs authorities and contribute to trade facilitation, reviewing the current level of implementation of new technologies in customs and shedding light on the opportunities and the challenges customer authorities face when deploying those technologies. The outcome of the two WCO online technology conferences and the number of WCO regional online workshops on disruptive technologies 
held during the pandemic have also been incorporated into the study report, resulting in 42 case studies and further information. In this connection, I thank the WCO members for their contributions, but also wish to express my appreciation for the support from the private sector and academia in the finalization of the report in the spirit of customs business partnership. The report reflects a high level of customs interest and activity in the testing and implementation of three groups of technologies in particular, blockchain, Internet of Things, and data analytics and artificial intelligence. These technologies are expected to support customs in accessibility of quality data, efficiency of custom procedures, and better risk management. They also help customs implement international rules and standards in ensuring uh, connectivity at borders, such as the WCO Reverse Kyoto Convention and the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement. The report shows the interest of customs in expanding the use of these technologies, as well as the confidence in the benefits they will bring to customs in achieving its objectives and supporting cross-border trade. On the other hand, it identifies several obstacles to overcome, including the lack of expertise or good practices, accuracy of data or legal issues, to name a few. The study report will remain a living document and will be constantly updated to reflect further advancement and trend changes in the area of application of disruptive technologies by customs. As part of our continuous effort, the WCO will organize its annual technology conference and exhibition 2002 from 18 to 20 October in Maastricht, the Netherlands. And I would like to cordially invite all of you as it reflects this year's WTO theme of building a data-driven culture in customs. Finally, I would like to encourage participants to make good use of the information that we will present it in this webinar and to actively contribute to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Next, I'd like to give the floor to the World Trade Organization Director General, Dr. Okonjo Iwela. Director General, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Secretary General, it's good to be with you, dear Kunio, uh, on this occasion. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I can see there are really many people from around the world who are joining us uh, today, and that's wonderful. It's a real pleasure to be with you today for the launch of this joint WCO WTO study report on disruptive technologies. Digitalization is at the center of how we do business today. It has become a driving force for economic growth and trade expansion. Disruptive technologies like blockchain, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, and machine learning enable new and innovative business models that can contribute to making trade more efficient and inclusive, such as online retail and lean inventory. They also have the potential to significantly reduce border-related fixed costs, which is especially important for smaller firms. Governments must not lag behind as businesses use digitalization to operate more effectively. The good news, as this study makes clear, is that many governments are doing just that. They are using or experimenting with various digital technologies, blockchain for electronic doc documentation and identity management, IoT for asset tracking, virtual reality for training customs officers, and AI for better risk assessment, more accurate HS classification, fighting counterfeiting and better trade monitoring. For example, AI is useful to see how trade flows shift after tariffs are changed. The use of disruptive technologies opens up many opportunities to improve customs processes and contribute to the implementation of the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, as the Secretary General said. What I like about this publication is that it's very practical. 
It examines current and potential uses and benefits of these technologies. But it also acknowledges that using them can be challenging and costly and offers suggestions for how to think about costs, benefits, and potential risks associated with their use. The publication also includes a useful set of case studies, allowing members to learn from each other's experiences and successes. I'm told that the new publication builds on a report the WCO published in 2019. I'm pleased that the WTO could join forces with the WCO for this update, which draws on a wider range of sources and will target a broader range of government agencies across our respective memberships. This breadth of target audiences is important. One lesson that stands out from this publication is the need for a whole of government approach to developing strategies for the use of technology in border management. One of the greatest benefits of technology is the collection and sharing of data. But this benefit can only be realized if all processes are digitalized and if data can flow from one system to another. For instance, many members have saved time and money by replacing paper copies of phytosanitary certificates for agricultural products with an electronic process. But the benefits from this are limited if other border agencies still rely on old fashioned paper based processes. A whole of government approach would build compatible processes across different agencies that can all link into a common system such as a single window. That would start to unleash the full potential of digitalization. Cooperation with the private sector is equally important. Digitalization is already heavily used in supply chains and e-commerce, though port and transport CEOs tell us that there's a lot more room to use tech to improve logistics efficiency. That said, if government systems can connect directly to digitized supply chain data, it can contribute to greater compliance and faster border clearance. Many developing and least developed WTO members are currently in the process of implementing the trade facilitation agreement. This publication sheds light on how many different technologies might be incorporated into trade facilitation implementation plans. There's a strong case for development partners to work to narrow the digital divide by supporting developing countries to make full use of digitalization in TFA implementation. As technology continues to evolve rapidly, I hope that our two organizations will collaborate on future updates to this publication. In closing, I would like to thank the WTO and WCO members that provided case studies and information as well as the staff of both organizations. Emmanuel and team, thank you so much. Norbert and team, thank you so much for your excellent work and the close collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director General. We appreciate you uh, joining us today. I'd like to highlight that a link to the study report has been placed in the chat for you to take advantage of. Uh, we will have French and Spanish versions uh, available shortly. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to invite Emmanuel Gan, Senior Analyst, Economic Research and Statistics Division at the, at the WTO, and Aslam Soisanli, a technical officer here at the WCO, to share the key findings of the study report that we're launching here today. Ladies, over to you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. In our presentation, Emmanuel and I will give you a flower of uh, what is uh, included in the study report. The study report on disruptive technologies 2022 is the result of the collective effort of the WCO and the WTO secretariats, working closely with the customs administrations, private sector representatives, and other stakeholders. As the Secretary General and the Director General highlighted in their opening remarks, it was built on the first version published in 2019. The results of a survey on the use of particular disruptive technologies by customs 
conducted in 2021. And also the paper prepared based on the results of this survey have been incorporated into this update of the report. Moreover, outcomes of the uh, WCO regional workshops and tech cons have also been reflected in the report. The two organizations partnered in updating this study report in order to ensure, first of all, the broader trade perspective. The first part of the study report focuses on seven technologies, namely blockchain and distributed ledger technology, Internet of Things, Big Data, Data Analytics, Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning, Biometrics, Drones, Virtual Augmented and Mixed Reality, and 3D printing. The second part of the report includes 42 case studies from customs administrations, private sector, international organizations, and other stakeholders. The report also provides recommendations and lessons learned, as well as WCO and WTO initiatives in this area. Over to you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Aslim. Now, the first technology being discussed is blockchain, which is a technology that can bring various benefits to trade from increased security to greater transparency, greater efficiency because it enables peer-to-peer -peer interaction and automation through smart contracts, and greater compliance. But there are also a number of challenges and risks associated with the use of blockchain. And key challenges cited by customs in deploying blockchain solutions include lack of expertise, cost and governance issues. But interoperability, scalability, legal issues and privacy will also have to be addressed for blockchain to be used on a wide scale. The report discusses the potential of blockchain uh, for customs purposes and the areas in which it is currently deployed. And the main areas where it is being deployed include e-commerce, exchange of information, certification and single window environment, risk management and automation. As mentioned by Oslim, the study report also includes a number of case studies and actually quite a few of the 42 case studies of the report relate to blockchain. They concern a diverse set of issues and are developed by governments from various regions, Latin America, Asia and Europe in particular, as well as from private sector actors. And uh, these appear in italics on the screen. Uh, the Port of Rotterdam, for example, submitted a case study on the use of blockchain for customs clearance. The next technology we look at is the Internet of Things, which is all about asset tracking. Now, asset tracking has become ex extremely important in supply chain management. It is used for monitoring the movement of goods and containers in real time, with a view to improving risk management and efficiency of customs clearance processes. And because it enhances the volume and variety of data, it enables better analytics. Now, all of this is best achieved by partnering with other stakeholders like shippers, carriers, forwarders to allow customs to have access to a bigger pool of data. Now, IoT often works actually in tandem with other technologies like blockchain and AI. However, Integrating IoT with customs processes can be complex and costly, and there are interoperability issues of various IoT systems, and lack of expertise within customs is also a challenge. Now, about half of the customs authorities surveyed use IoT technologies in customs business processes, such as X-ray scanners, QR code readers, or cameras to read license plates. For example, a number of customs administrations are monitoring the movement of cargo in real time, specifically shipments in transit. And we have one case study submitted by Kenya in the report about the regional electronic cargo tracking system. The UAE also uses IoT for cargo tracking for risk mitigation, and the port of Bari in Italy uses it to optimize the multimodal movement of goods. And we have a fourth case study in the in the study report from Guatemala, uh, where they use uh, RFID antennas, container code recognition to modernize customs processes. And it's really a case study about lessons learned and the need to carefully integrate software and hardware. The third set of technologies we look at in the report is uh, big data, AI, so artificial intelligence and machine learning, which could be some of the most disruptive technologies. AI opens interesting opportunities in terms of risk management, compliance, predictions, 
revenue collection and image recognition. But AI is a technology that is not easy to deploy, that requires specific skills, can be costly, and integration with existing legacy systems can be complex. In addition, deploying it also presents significant risks. AI is often being criticized, for example, for being a black box. It's not clear how the system works. There is also a need for strong ethical principles combined with robust compliance and legal frameworks to ensure that AI is not misused. And finally, access to robust and transparent redress mechanisms will be required to ensure the integrity and ongoing improvement of AI processes. AI is already being used extensively by customers for various purposes, ranging from risk management. And we have two case studies from the Netherlands and the Russian Federation, for example, on this particular issue. It's also being used for agents classification. Here again, we have two case studies from Belgium in Brazil. Uh, it's used for scanning and image recognition. And we have one case study from China, but also for revenue collection post-clearance audits and control, and chatbots, and we have one case study on chatbots from Zambia. Over to you, Eslem. Thank you, Emmanuel. Biometrics is a rapidly growing field in the information technology sector, with fingerprint recognition expected to remain the most dominant form of biometric technology. Currently, it is mostly used for immigration and border security enforcement. A number of projects are also being implemented by customs authorities. Customs agencies should monitor this field closely to identify additional uses, such as uh, verifying identities and controlling the access of customs operators, or identifying the different actors in the supply chain. Increased security is identified as the main benefit of using biometrics in different areas. However, there are significant concerns about the use of biometrics, in particular that it may not be limited to identity verification only. As customs agencies and other actors in the international supply chain move towards the uh, wider implementation of biometrics, there are several considerations that administrations must take into consideration such as legal and physical barriers that could be overcome with political will. There are a number of case studies in the report, uh, as I mentioned previously, regarding the implementation of biometrics as well, and we would like to invite you to have a look at them. Drones are already being used by some customs administrations uh, for surveillance and monitoring purposes. Drones can also play a very important role when it comes to the uh, domestic and cross-border deliveries. The major challenge in this uh, area is the unavailability of drone policy framework for developing drone regulations. There are also some security concerns as well as risk of using drones for smuggling. The use of virtual reality solutions for customs training purposes has been successfully employed by government bodies like uh, Dubai Customs. There are different potential future uses in customs and uh, border management for virtual augmented and mixed reality, such as uh, physical inspection to protect intellectual property rights, perform efficient uh, security screenings, identify and assess vehicles, provide uh, translating services and visualization of big data sets. The WCO virtual train uh, reality training project, which uh, uses virtual reality to train customs officers, was launched with uh, financial support of CCF Korea in 2021. The 3D printing market is growing rapidly. It is widely used for industrial, medical, construction, and consumer goods. It is also at the early stages of adoption within the automotive and aerospace sectors, as well as in the consumer electronics sector. The implications of 3D printing for origin, valuation, IPR, and security, and for VAT in particular, have been stressed in the WCO in different meetings. In order to respond to challenges in assessing the overall impact of 3D printers, national monitoring of them, and also their impact on trade, the new heading 84.85 for additive manufacturing was created as part of the 2022 edition of the WCO harmonized system. Over to you, Emmanuel. 
Thanks, Osla. So in conclusion, uh, the study report includes a summary of the various recommendations that have emerged from discussions held at the WCO and at the WTO over the past few years on the use of disruptive technologies by customs. These recommendations are articulated around five themes, which are the importance of cooperation, standardization, legislative work, awareness raising capacity building and IT infrastructure, and experience sharing and joint work. And this concludes our presentation of the key findings of the study report. Of course, we invite you to read the whole study report, uh, which is now available in English on the WCU and WTO websites, and the French version uh, will be made available very soon. So thank you very much, and uh, back to you, Brendan. Great, thanks so much, uh, Oslam and uh, Emmanuel, for that uh, uh, very nice uh, overview. Uh, now we'll take a, a little bit of a turn. We've allocated 10 minutes uh, for each of the speakers uh, in, the, in this next panel, which will be followed by a 20 minute question and answer session. If you would, for the participants, if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat box function, uh, preferably indicating to whom you would like the, uh, your question to be addressed. Um, I would now like to invite Alejandro Jimenez, project leader from Argentine Customs uh, for his presentation. So over to you. Bueno, muy buenos días, buenas tardes a todos. Sí, mi nombre es Alejandro Jiménez, pertenezco al Departamento de Desarrollo de Sistemas de la Administración Federal de Ingresos Públicos. Sí. Eh, y eh, principalmente quisiera agradecer la invitación a este importante evento de tecnología disruptiva y compartir con ustedes la experiencia que eh, tenemos con respecto a la implementación de la red blockchain ¿sí? en el ámbito del Mercosur, en el marco del de proyecto BICONNECT. La red blockchain eh, interconecta eh, servicios de Argentina, Brasil, Bolivia, Paraguay y Uruguay. En el año eh, 2020, en noviembre de 2020, se eh, establece en tanto en producción como en testing una, eh, las dos redes para eh, el intercambio de información. Sí. Excuse me, Argentina. La, Argentina hola. Your presentation sí. is not sí, sí. full screen, and you are still on the first slide. Sí. Ahora ya pasé a la segunda diapositiva. ¿Se ve? ¿Conceptos técnicos? No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, first, put your presentation to full screen. The little icon at the bottom right. Ahí sí. Ahí se ve. Una pantalla completa. ¿Se ve? We... Unfortunately, we're still yeah. on full screen, but at least we are on the second slide now. Secretary, are we prepared to assist? Seven. Conceptos técnicos, sí. Se puede ver con los conceptos técnicos. Hola. No, that's a negative. I'm sorry. Uh, I will stop your sharing and Secretariat will share for you, sir. Seems you're facing some technical difficulties. Uh -huh. You will have to say next. Perfecto. Right? Está perfecto, perfecto. Bueno, perfecto. Bueno, la, eh, bien, la siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Bien. Con respecto a la herramienta eh, utilizada para el desarrollo de la red de blockchain, ¿sí? se utilizó eh, Fabrix ¿sí? en su versión 1.4. ¿okay? Para hacer un poquito de historia, el, el tema de la red blockchain inicialmente ¿sí? eh, fue propuesta por Brasil, ¿sí? luego eh, digamos, fue tratada en el ámbito del Mercosur, de la Comisión Técnica, 
y aprobada para eh, su desarrollo e implementación. Siguiente, por favor. El primer caso de uso eh, utilizado fue lo que es el operador económico autorizado. Hasta el momento se está utilizando eh, planillas Excel para el intercambio de información. Siguiente, por favor. A través del consenso entre los eh, países del Mercosur se decidió intercambiar los datos que podemos ver eh, en pantalla. ¿sí? Por resultado de la identificación de empresa, rol, domicilio, tipo de domicilio, país, provincia, las certificaciones de Estado y el tipo de certificación. Siguiente, por favor. En lo que respecta al formato del mensaje a intercambiar, se está utilizando JSON como formato, ¿sí? y eh, se diseñaron los métodos para poder realizar altas, bajas y modificaciones de, de información que se está intercambiando. Fabric permite lenguaje de investigación general, un lenguaje propietario, ¿sí? y el smart contract de Biconet eh, fue diseñado eh, con eh, TypeScript. Tenemos que destacar que el repositorio ¿sí? de fuentes eh, se encuentra en Paraguay. Paraguay se, se ofreció para, para tener los fuentes ¿sí? personados. ¿sí? Y eh, podemos decir que no hay una eh, política de incentivo con respecto a la utilización de, 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 este, eh, de esta mensajería. ¿sí? Y todas las... Eh, o sea, toda modificación requiere un consenso entre todos los países. Siguiente, por favor. Bien, como dijimos, el, se diseñó el, el mensaje en el formato JSON y con respecto a la estructura, está basado en el modelo de datos de la OMA, tomando como el paquete base interno. Acá podemos ver un ejemplo ¿sí? de un mensaje eh, en formato en que se intercambia. Siguiente, por favor. Tenemos que destacar que, eh, como dijimos inicialmente, eh, en el año 2020 fue cuando se eh, diseña la red blockchain y esto digamos, fue hecho todo en el ámbito de, digamos, de la pandemia. ¿tá? donde eh, con todas las, limitas, las limitaciones que eso implicaba, eh, eh, digamos, todo se tenía que realizar por videoconferencia y demás. Eh, en este momento digamos, está implementado en producción el intercambio de información entre Argentina y Brasil. En testing están trabajando tanto Paraguay y Uruguay y se espera digamos, que eh, o sea, Paraguay y Uruguay puedan eh, ingresar a producción a fines de año, principio del, del siguiente. Y después es, expandir digamos, esta red ¿sí? a los demás países, entre ellos eh, Bolivia y eh, demás países de la TIT. El próximo desafío es eh, poder realizar el intercambio de información de las tablas de referencias correspondiente al sistema de Cintia. Cintia es un sistema de información de tránsitos internacionales aduaneros, eh, se refiere al seguimiento de los tránsitos internacionales, ¿sí? con información de, eh, o sea, información de, de, de sumaria y detallada, ¿sí? eh, y eh, eso es lo que en este momento se están consensuando formatos y para poder implementarlo esto en una, eh, en una etapa próxima, ¿sí? digamos dentro de este año, ¿sí? o principio del, del que viene. Siguiente. Bueno, esto es lo que nosotros estamos trabajando en estos momentos. ¿Sí? Estamos, eh, tomamos como inicialmente el, eh, digamos, el caso de uso de OEA porque eh, pensamos que era eh, un ejercicio digamos, eh, no demasiado complejo para poder eh, experimentar es, es, eh, esta cuestión de, digamos, de la utilización de la red blockchain. Muchas gracias a todos.
que tenga buenas tardes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jimenez, for that uh, practical experience in uh, Argentina. Uh, next, I would like to give the floor to Norbert Kuenhoven, Strategy and I Innovation Advisor at the Customs Administration of the Netherlands. So Norbert, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, congratulations with uh, your report. I think it's an excellent report uh, with a lot of interesting uh, projects and ideas. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Um, I'm going to talk, of course, about disruptive technologies. And um, I'm going to talk about auto detection and artificial intelligence mostly. Uh, first, I want to share my supervision dream or our supervision dream of the Dutch customs. And coming from the country where famous painters as Rembrandt and Van Gogh um, are born, and I have uh, made a picture of on your right hand side see that um, of a ship uh, with a lot of containers uh, waiting on the key to go to Europe. And um, at the departure, we already see a number of documents available, the purchase order, shipping instructions, the invoice, certificate of origin. And um, then you see the containers moving in a stream, in a flow to Europe, where there's another set of uh, the import declaration is made and it's going into, into the EU. That's an example of a supply chain. And the supervision is uh, the supervision dream we have is to use these pre-departure documents to use the entry summary declarations, the bill of lading, all that stuff to get early insights pre-departure of what is going to move. The other thing is we want to insight in stream patterns. So all the banana containers, what is their usual routing? What is their usual timing? Um, a, a clothing, uh, what is their usual price and average price of a container, all, all the patterns, the routes, the behaviors we'd like to analyze. Then we have, uh, besides the post-departure insights, we can have inspections or interventions, and they can be pre-arrival, they can be on-arrival, they can be post-arrival, uh, deck sweeps, um, opening containers, whatever uh, can happen. And um, post-arrival, definitely uh, uh, giving containers the room to move beyond the border, uh, but still having them under control and even doing post-arrival uh, checks or interventions. Uh, our dream is to do that, to automate it, collect data. So from um, public sector, sorry, private sector uh, platforms, from uh, sensors, from cameras, from uh, x-ray scans, all kinds of sensors that automatically collect data. And with those data to automatically do the risk analysis. So um, automatically, and, and the, the reason for that dream is because uh, we, uh, we experience that on a daily basis. If you think of a port of Rotterdam, uh, per year we have about 700 million packages to open and it's just too much to do it manually. So we're really looking for automated processes. For that automated dream, um, the disruptive technology we're looking at is AI models, artificial intelligence. Data science is uh, really important for that. Um, it can help us uh, to derive risk profiles from historic data. We can develop models to, um, to filter false positive profile hits. The more simple risk profiles we use today give a lot of hits, alerts, I should say, give a lot of alerts, uh, so much so much they 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 cloud the, the work of an analyst. So by filtering them to pick the most interesting ones out, that's already a big uh, efficiency improvement. Um, we want to develop uh, predictive risk models, uh, on the one hand for classification. So what's the, the, the chance, the percentage, the probability that uh, a postal package has something suspicious? Uh, or detection um, models really uh, sh showing there is something you should look at. And anomalies, so things that are out of the normal to, to indicate them. Um, we definitely, and it was mentioned before, uh, want to use uh, risk profiles, but more or less uh, more even artificial intelligence models to use external data. So not only custom declaration data, but also, and more even the, the private sector data that is out in the open and the data from other customs agencies, uh, from other government authorities that are around. 
combining all these um, with artificial intelligence uh, brings a lot of benefits. Um, to do artificial intelligence, we need data. Uh, the data are extremely important. Without data, there's no artificial intelligence at all. We have two types of data. The one is structured data, so tabular data. Uh, think of uh, declaration forms, uh, inspection results, um, internal data that we have as customs or as governments, also external data, uh, platforms like TradeLens, One Record, um, GC GSBN. There's a lot of private sector platforms these days that have a lot of data that we can structuredly use and put in a table and then apply easily. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit more about unstructured data, um, images, documents, things that you cannot read, but you have to analyze. And uh, you can do it uh, manually, that is with a person's eyes. Uh, people get, uh, it, it's very cumbersome. Uh, people who do that are very uh, quickly uh, tired. They don't see things anymore. You, you will notice that when you're in airlines uh, and you're going to fly and with the hand luggage security checks, Every five minutes, there's a new guy or lady uh, looking at the x-ray images from your luggage because it's just too, too intensive to do a long time for a human being. So unstructured data analyzed automatically. Um, a number of projects we have. Um, we do projects at uh, the Dutch Customs Administration, by the way, in collaboration with other countries, uh, Belgium, uh, US. We have a number of collaboration uh, groupings around these projects. Uh, one is uh, deriving risk profiles from historical data, just analyzing, analyzing historical data and see if we can get simple profiles from that. The project is called Profile, together with Belgium Customs, amongst others. Filtering false positive profile hits. We have projects uh, developing predictive risk models. So for classifications, I'm going to talk a bit about that, about detection, so indicating where is the stuff, and about anomalies where we have a wish list, but not a lot of current projects where we can point to. And we're developing risk profiles and AI models using external data. So combining X-ray images and external data gives more value, and, and actually you need to combine uh, the images with structured data to get good results. Diving in deeper, one example is an X-ray project we have on postal packages. We're going to show that in, uh, in two weeks time, we have the WCO TI and IT conference in Maastricht, where we do as Dutch Customs a demo of that uh, project, where we have um, developed an, a model, an, art, an artificial intelligence model, which can look at goods and classify them. So um, it looks specifically for pills, and uh, so pills, drugs in postal packages. So it's uh, connected to the 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 the, the belt, uh, the production production belt of post, the post office, and all the packages that come in are X-ray scanned. Our AI model is looking at um, uh, the pictures and gives a probability of twenty percent, thirty percent, eighty percent that there are pills in the package. This is created uh, by uh, feeding, by training the model with images. That's how they work. These artificial intelligence tools, you feed them with, this is a, uh, uh, a picture of uh, a postal package with pills. This is one without pills. This is one with pills. And if you feed it long enough, at some point it starts to recognize, um, uh, give, uh, give judgments by itself. If you then feed them a blank postal package, it will say this has pills. And then you tell them, no, you were wrong. And it will take that into account. So you keep feeding it after you first analyzed it. So it, it's never stopped. And you need a lot of training material for that. So that's one project we did. Another one is um, more, uh, it's the other way around, where we, uh, scan -alyze, where we analyze scans. And the, as you see on, on the picture here, where the, the model indicates where the pills are in the picture with a circle. So that's more easy to to uh, to um, um, use a similar project uh, on another topic is on trucks on containers where we look at containers again to classify them what's the probability that this container has drugs bananas weapons you can feed it with all kind of images 
and uh, the other way, uh, a detection where the image uh, is looked at by the artificial intelligence module and even indicates where the stuff is uh, that you're looking for in the container. So again, this requires a lot of training materials and a lot of training. Um, also the combination, which I mentioned with structured data, you wanna know from the declaration or from the freight documents, we think this is container with cucumbers. And then you look at an X-ray and you see, uh, you train a model to recognize how an X-ray scan of cucumbers looks. And that's the way it's one model looking for cucumbers and giving the probability that there's cucumbers in that container. If you want to look for cauliflowers, you need to train again with pictures of cauliflowers and x-ray images. So um, I wouldn't say it's never ending, but it's it's not a simple thing. It's, it's a continuous journey to build your uh, portfolio of models. Our next steps, we could, this is where we are. We are at the beginning of a long and ambitious journey but we're making good progress. We know what to do, how to do it. Um, what we need, what are our next steps at Dutch Customs Authority is a database with annotated, as we call it, images of pills in postal packages of X-ray scans, cucumbers, X-ray scans of cauliflowers, X-ray scans of weapons, X test data, test data, test data. This is really um, something we need. Uh, where we need to collaborate and, and maybe the WCO can help there. But uh, that is something where we would uh, bring, should bring together all the data and images we collect collectively. Second thing, uh, an IT environment, which is fit to do this. This requires a lot of uh, cloud environment, safety, security. Uh, it's not easy and it's different from our usual legacy environment where we process declarations one after the other and do an if and then else check. IT environment, storage, training, deployment of data and AI models. And the third thing, uh, adjust the workflow. So uh, the whole uh, uh, the supervision process will also be changed. Uh, now it's on arrival getting a declaration flagged. It will be during transport, during even pre-departure, already getting signs uh, and maybe actions, a different way of working. So we also need to take into account that this AI Disruptive technology implies also different organization work. Um, that was uh, just very brief, 10 minutes uh, explanation of what we're doing at Dutch Customs and the potential of artificial intelligence as a disruptive technology. Back to, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Norbert. And um, I'm so glad that you brought up the WCO Technology Conference coming up in just about two weeks. We'll certainly see you there, and I hope to see many more participants uh, at the conference uh, as well. Uh, next, I'd like to give the floor to Ibrahim Maifada Abubakar, Principal Inspector at Niger Customs, for his presentation. So the floor is over to you. Merci beaucoup. Vous m'entendez wow. Oui, affirmatif, monsieur. Merci beaucoup. Donc, je suis Ibrahim Maïfada Boubacar, je suis chef de la division coopération douanière au Niger. Donc, je voudrais aujourd'hui partager mon expérience suite à une saisie que nous avons effectuée quand j'étais chef de la Brigade nationale d'intervention. Donc, la Brigade nationale d'intervention, c'est une structure opérationnelle qui est chargée, qui est rattachée à la direction de la lutte contre la fraude. Donc, dans le cadre de, de nos activités quotidiennes, nous avons expérimenté et, les données GeoInt. Donc, c'est dans ce cadre que nous avons effectué une saisie. Comme vous pouvez le constater, le Niger est un pays enclavé, c'est-à-dire qu'il est dépourvu de port. Donc, la majeure partie des marchandises qui viennent ou qui transitent par le Niger nous vient de différents ports comme le port du Lomé, du Togo, le port du Bénin ou celui de la Côte d'Ivoire ou du Ghana. Donc, plus de 95% de nos importations viennent par la voie terrestre, terrestre via ces différents ports de débarquement. Donc, la principale préoccupation aujourd'hui de la douane nigérienne, c'est la contrebande. Souvent, et toutes ces marchandises ou bien tous ces camions qui sont destinés au Niger ne viennent pas au bon port. Donc, nous avons expérimenté deux types 
de données GeoInt, c'est-à-dire les données de points de passage et celui de développement des différents villages frontaliers. Donc, par rapport à la première expérience, c'est lors, dans le cadre de nos sorties, de nos patrouilles et sorties, nous avons expérimenté les données de points de passage. Donc, qu'est-ce qui s'est passé Nous étions à la brigade nationale. Il y a deux camions qui étaient destinés pour le Niger via, le, via Torodi, qui devait normalement venir au Niger. Mais malheureusement, nous avons constaté qu'une semaine après, avant, une semaine après du moins, ces marchandises ne sont pas encore arrivées au bon port. Donc, c'est en ce moment que nous avons contacté nos douanes, les, les douanes burkinabés, pour avoir plus d'informations par rapport à ces camions qui ont quitté le port de Lomé. Donc, le poste frontalier nous a confirmé que ces conteneurs ont effectivement quitté le territoire burkinabé et que normalement, à pareil moment, ils devraient être au Niger. Mais malheureusement, une semaine après, nous n'avons toujours pas pris en charge ces camions. Ces camions n'ont pas été pris en charge. Donc, on a appelé, on a contacté le, euh, le bureau destinataire qui nous a confirmé qu'effectivement, ces conteneurs n'étaient pas encore par nous. Donc, il se pourrait qu'il se trouvait qu'en ce moment, on était en train d'expérimenter les données géo -int. Donc, euh, je contactais Thomas, Thomas Quintens, qui était le conseiller du DG de douane du Niger en ce moment. Et là, il nous a mis en contact avec une société privée qui nous a envoyé des images, n'est-ce pas, des différents villages frontaliers du Burkina, de la frontière burkinabé. Donc, euh, en parcourant ces différentes images, nous avons constaté que dans, parmi les trois images, il n'y a qu'un seul village dans lequel nous avons deux magasins contenant des toits. Donc, à partir de ces images, nous avons en collaboration avec euh, les forces de sécurité qui sont dans la région, parce qu'il faut noter que Torodi est une zone d'insécurité, que les douanes seules ne peuvent pas aller sur le terrain. Donc, en collaboration avec les autres forces de sécurité, nous sommes allés sur le terrain et nous avons constaté, au niveau de ces deux magasins, à l'aide des images que nous avons, de haute résolution que nous avons reçues, nous sommes partis jusqu'au niveau des deux magasins. Et effectivement, ces deux containers que nous attendions au niveau du bureau de douanement ont été déchargés avant même de venir au niveau du bureau destinataire. Et le propriétaire était en train d'acheminer ces mêmes marchandises à l'aide des de motocycles et puis à l'aide des de petits véhicules. Et nous avons interpellé le propriétaire et en ce moment, nous avons commencé la procédure et les pénalités ont été appliquées. Donc voilà un peu comment, dans le temps, on, effectivement aussi, on a utilisé des des fiches qu'on appelle les DTR, les documents topographiques de référence. Donc, à partir des images que nous recevons, lorsqu'il y a des sorties au niveau des brigades, nous donnons ces fiches-là aux éléments qui vont sur le terrain. Donc, à partir de ces fiches, vous avez les données des différents points de passage au niveau de la frontière et également, éventuellement, les différentes pistes des contrebandiers. Donc, voilà un peu l'expérience que j'ai voulu partager avec vous et sur l'utilisation des données GeoInt. Merci à vous. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent uh, example coming from Niger. Uh, finally, I'd like to give the floor to Kiyang Kim, the Assistant Director of the ICT and Data Planning Division at Korea Customs. So Ms. Kim, the floor is yours. Thank you for giving the great opportunity. My name is KY Kim from Korea Customs. Today, I'd like to share our Korea Customs big data uh, strategies. So before we talking about the big data, i like to uh, talk about the data warehouse. Uh, Korea Customs called the data warehouse uh, adding customs CDW data warehouse concept is really great, amazing tool to uh, as a early stage of a big data. But data warehouse has uh, some limitation. Uh, there are some certain percentage of our whole entire data is stored, and uh, many users can use on the data warehouse as uh, search some data or produce the, some statistics. Also, there are lots of uh, needs, uh, volume of unstructured data. 
Uh, so Korea Customs decided adopting big data concept because Korea Customs stored every structured and unstructured data, such as X-ray images, investigation report, and GPS uh, information uh, in bond cargo movement. Also, we stored lots of external big data, such as NTS tax record, because Korea customs are sharing lots of information with other government uh, agencies. Also, we generate every day lots of semi structured data such as system log. And also we are now recently using the lots of uh, SNS social media data. So we adopting various advanced analysis for the big data. So in 2017, we conducted research and development study to apply of the big data from initial planning to utilization. And next year, we established mid and long-term strategy plans to reflect internal and external environment changes. And 2020, we uh, selected five Korea customs experts to build a task force team. And the same year, we established the Big Data Center as a body of the headquarter. And since 2017, 115 custom officials can enjoy the benefit uh, to train more than half of our years of intensive training in ICT technology uh, operated by best ICT training company. And they rebuilt multiple projects and uh, lots of big data models uh, for, for years. And digitalized procedures uh, created by the concept of big data or AI above existing procedures. So today I like to share three big data systems adopting in Korea customs. So first one is AI customs clearance model. First, it generates group of high-risk data for a certain period of time based on the company and item to measure the risk uh, level of import declaration, and then rapidly learn from their clearance data using AI deep learning screening model. And this model is adopting in a risk management system and in it has proved uh, lots of real percipient effectiveness in the real cases. Second one is the AI trade finance monitoring system using machine learning and rule-based algorithm using transaction, financial, and foreign exchange data. It identified companies committed uh, financial fraud that manipulated price worth, which worth 130 million US dollars since 2019. And this system, we called it Big Finder, and this system uh, produced a lot of uh, user-friendly visualization, uh, which shows correlations of risk models, especially in high risk of the travelers and explorers import supply chains and bypass imports of delinquents. So Korea Customs uh, allowing the lots of budget for the only big data. So in 2020, we um, build 12 models, some such as prediction or uh, HS suggestions, and we launched uh, Korea Customs big data portal. And Last year, we also built 12 models more, and still now we are developing big data model 
to write the uh, to make the right decision. Okay, thank you for attention. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, presentation and uh, a, a huge thank you to uh, all of the uh, panelists for keeping to the time. This ensures that we do have uh, quite, a, uh, quite enough time for a question and answer session. So uh, what I would like to remind uh, participants of is that you may use the chat box function to ask your questions. And please do include who you are posing that uh, question to. Uh, we've, we've had a number of questions come in uh, uh, during the uh, presentations. Uh, and I would like to uh, invite not only the panelists, uh, but uh, our colleagues uh, from the WCO and WTO, Oslam and Emmanuel, to uh, jump in uh, as well, if you like. Um, one of the first questions that came through is, what are the possible impact of disruptive technology to a developing country like Nigeria? And I'm wondering if any of our panelists would like to uh, uh, tackle that question. And if you would, feel free to, uh, to speak up. Uh, I wonder why, why specifically Nigeria. I would say every customs organization in the world has an issue of um, uh, supervision, and supervision uh, can be uh, strengthened by the use of uh, analyzing data and, and artificial intelligence. So I would say uh, yes, Nigeria could definitely benefit. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Norbert, while we've, uh, we've got you here, there were a couple of other questions that came through. And uh, let me give you at least uh, three or four of them, because I think you could probably uh, answer them fairly succinctly. Uh, first question is, how do you access private data? Do you have to purchase it? The second question is, given that the relevance of the results generated by machine learning or AI depends on the quality of data. How can you ensure the quality of external data, invoices, transport tickets, certificate of origin, et cetera, before feeding the system? The next question is, what is the level of human intervention related to one, risk profile development, and two, predictive model development? So I'll let you tackle those. I think you can uh, you can get them. Yeah, these uh, certainly let me know. These are questions that touch on to the core of the whole artificial intelligence process. So, uh, first, uh, the easy one: um, private sector data. Uh, so far, Dutch Customs is not paying uh, for a, a private sector data. Of course, you could, if there is somebody with a specific uh, set of data you're very interested in, you can buy them, or you can try to buy them. But what we do is we um, try to get into a give to get mode where uh, as a customs, we um, facilitate uh, those who are those uh, supply chains who are willing to share or to, to give access to their supply chain data. Uh, TradeLens is an example of that, uh, a blockchain platform uh, largely used by Ocean Container Transport where uh, by having, for example, well, I won't give details, actually, let me not go too deep, but by getting access to their data, we can use those data to combine with our declaration information and we can check uh, certain things or, or get better insights. We get that for free because we um, give them um, uh, a de-risking. That's what we can always uh, uh, promise. And we're working to give them more facilitation even. The dream is, the dream is that we at some point even abolish declarations because we will have all the data that we have, for example, for an entry summary declarations. We can get all those data from uh, the bill of lading and, and all kinds of um, uh, uh, documents uh, which they are willing to share with us. Um, so there's a there's that's legally not allowed yet in the European Union, but it's definitely where we want to go. And that, that immediately connects me to uh, the next question, the quality. How can we uh, ensure quality of private sector data? That is, of course, uh, a challenge. Uh, by the way, it's also a challenge to look at the quality of declar customs declarations because they're, I guess, they're more light uh, in, in customs declarations than there are lies in private sector data. 
because what we use uh, as Dutch customs is the uh, the data there that are actually used in the operation. So the bill of lading, which is actually a freight contract, is a legal document between the transporter and and the shipper, and that is uh, has all kind of legal status uh, that you can really rely on. That uh, that doesn't say that all the data elements sometimes they are names which are later replaced but the core of what is trend, what is shipped from where to where uh, is 100 percent 99.99 reliable so you have to be um look very detailed at which data elements have which uh yeah status in in their use and if you can trust them more or less and um yeah some things are you cannot trust so you just use them as not trust the data you don't use them for uh, ai models um or you try to cross-check them with other sources. So, for example, uh, the gate out provided by a terminal in a, in, a, in a port, and a gate out provided by the, the ship, the shipper, so the the the, the, the ship captain. Uh, those can be th those can differ. So the one says I've left already, and the other says no, no, you're still uh, in the port, so you haven't left. Is that type of semantics? And by cross-checking, you can also upgrade the quality of data. We are not there yet as Dutch customs. Let me be clear, we are at the very beginning of this trajectory. Uh, so um, um, uh, yeah, it's the way to go, but we're in early stages. And then the last question was the, the human risk uh, thing, uh, the, the human factor. That is, um, we have as rule currently at Dutch customs that we always have a human decision uh, uh, after, formal decision after an AI algorithm makes a suggestion um, different from traffic uh, traffic fines where you get a fully automated uh, a ticket or at least I get them a ticket on my desk that I have been speeding and there's no human uh, in that system we still do human checks and in before we start an AI algorithm there's a big process that's getting stronger and stronger by auditing authorities in the Netherlands why are we using an AI algorithm is it necessary? Is it proportional? What data are we collecting? What data are we combining? Are we not biasing, uh, discrimination, all that stuff? We have to make a big file where we're very transparent about all the steps. A lot of work. It's a lot of work. But I'm, as a, as a citizen, I support that. That is the way to go. That each AI algorithm is yeah as transparent as possible and explainable to uh, outsiders. Great. Thank you very much for that, Norbert. Much appreciated. Um, the next question is uh, for Korea. The question is, what technology do you use for data analysis? Is the infrastructure on the cloud or on premises? So Ms. Kim, over to you. Okay. Um... Our infrastructure is not cloud yet. We use the on-premises. And uh, yes, that's the answer. And uh, which technology is the, we are using the lots of skills, prediction and regression, clustering, classification, network, lots of text mining. So we decided and to choose the one uh, specific skills uh, depends on the models. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question goes to Niger. The question is to find out if the goods in transit left the country of transit, why do you not use the data from the SIGMAT system, interconnected system for goods in transit? How do you intend to use and combine the data from GeoInt and from SIGMAT system and the SIGMAT system. So Niger, over to you. I'm sorry, I don't see him on this, at the very moment on okay. occasion, I think he's facing connection issues. Very good. So we'll, we'll, we'll go on. We have a, another question uh, for Korea. Um, and it is, you mentioned uh, about financial data. How deep is the financial data that KCS could collect? 
is it mandated by law or is it voluntary by the trader? Yeah, so some data uh, we can collect by the law, but uh, mostly we buy it, uh, especially company information uh, from the specialized uh, uh, company in uh, foreign. So something is the, the yeah, we collect it by the law, but um, mostly not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And for Argentina, uh, we have a question. What proposals are there to strengthen capacities and skills in the use of blockchain worldwide? So, Mr. Jimenez. Eh, bien, nosotros inicialmente, digamos, es muy reciente que empezamos con, eh, con la implementación de la red blockchain. Sí, estamos digamos, incursionando en, en la experiencia de, de los primeros intercambios. Eh, así que, bueno, esto, digamos, incluye una capacitación y demás. O sea, estamos en las, las primeras instancias. Eh, así que, bueno, es lo que, eh, lo que puedo decir en este momento. Thank you. Ok, thank you very much. I agree. Greatly appreciate that. Um, one more for uh, Norbert. How easy or difficult is it to develop and implement AI algorithm, algorithms supporting the supervision tasks of a customs administration? Norbert? Yeah, it's um, more difficult than I uh, expected when I started. So it's quite a lot of work. Uh, first, you have to um, uh, collect the test data which is a lot of work. Then you have to um, train a model, which is a uh, data scientist's work, that's technology. I would say almost one man year for a one model. Eh? So like detecting pills in post packages, one man year data science. Then you have a model, then you have to uh, test it and prove it works. So you have to do a shadow run for a while in uh, uh, compared with production data and, and the test data, if you're, if the signs of your, the, the results of the model are uh, acceptable. Um, and then uh, you have to, to implement a structure where you keep feeding back the results to the model that the model gets to be improved. And you face um, emotional resistance, I would call it from the, from the, um, the existing um, analysts who don't like, in the beginning at least, the artificial intelligence models. They, they feel the, the models they have used for many years are better, are more precise, don't come from headquarters. So there's also, um, um, you have to do a change, a mental change process. And once they're on board and they're trained how it works and with this learning cycle, as we call it, uh, the, the, the model becomes better and better and better. Um, and only then at some point your model gets better than the initial profiles because we are using profiles or, or, or rule-based algorithms as they were called in Korea's better word, I think in, in Korea's presentation. We're using them already and we're catching a lot of criminals. So, um, so that whole process, and then you have on the side to explain uh, you know, the ethical side, is it not biased? Uh, so I think um, it's more work than I expected. And if you say easily, just train a model and you have, um, an AI algorithm which gives you results, yes, but it's not only that. It's really to bring it into production, uh, and then you need the technology. I mean, the, 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 what I said, the, the, the IT environment to support that. That's even, if I might say, even for Dutch customs, a challenge. We have big mainframes processing lots of declaration forms. This is something else. Um, so um, also there, uh, you have to do a lot of work. So. Um, don't underestimate it. On the other hand, it's very rewarding. It really works. It gives you new insights. It gives you enormous potentials to, um, yeah, to 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 change your whole uh, supervision process. Uh, we call it blue, yellow, and green groupings of um, yeah clients. I was going to say, but it's not clients. It's um, uh, importers, where you give different risk regimes uh, to different groups of of uh, players um yeah so a lot of work but worth it 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question actually was addressed to both the Netherlands and Korea, but I will uh, po pose it to uh, Korea first. And it says, as cooperation between professionals with backgrounds in different fields is sometimes hard when they do not really understand each other, how do you make the customs for professionals and ICT experts speak the same language? In other words, how do you take the part the partly tacit knowledge, professional knowledge of the customs officers and make the ICT experts understand what is expected to be developed? Any tips? Korea? Okay, thank you. Uh, the Korea Customs trying to make a common interest uh, our custom officials in field and uh, lots of real uh, specialized organization of the government and especially university professors. So we uh, made uh, some professor as uh, professional team uh, consists of 33 uh, bodies. So we trying to um, make a lot of interest with other among the uh, agencies at the same time. Thank you. Well, maybe the 33 should be increased to 34 <laughs> by having Dutch customs uh, participate. But I think uh, that is one way to go so that we uh, share the data we can share and not, of course, all you know supervision data. Some things have to stay behind the curtain, but I think we can share a lot uh, test data, uh, risk indicators, uh, AI models, uh, what models are working. Uh, there's different type, uh, classification, uh, detection, anomalies, uh, standards. Uh, there's big uh, difference between standards. If you develop an AI model on certain technology clouds, you can only use them on that cloud. You can never not move them to another suppliers uh, cloud. So, so transportability that you can use in other ones and other customs organizations, AI models, um, uh, standards on X-ray scans that that everybody scans from the left hand side or everybody scans from the from the bottom or top so that you can compare x-ray scans from different countries etc 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 so there's a lot uh, in it and uh yeah I'm, I'm glad to hear about this korea in initiative of the 33 uh, organization we have some collaboration we work a lot with belgium government in i mentioned that in profile a project, uh, but also uh, we are, uh, as we speak, setting up uh, agreements with uh, uh, other customs organizations to work together in sharing data and, and uh, standard ideas, etc. And WCO definitely uh, can help us there, I think. It's a neutral body um, who could provide us a platform for sharing data, sharing ideas. So I'm, I'm, we're, we're as Dutch customs are open for collaboration. We need to collaborate here. Great, thanks very much indeed. A lot of collaboration is needed. The next question is for Argentina. And the question is, on what date was the exchange between Argentina and Brazil implemented in production? So Argentina, over to you. Bien, entre Argentina y Brasil. Bueno, eh, digamos, inicialmente, La propuesta, como, como dije en la presentación, fue eh, a través de Brasil en un subgrupo técnico que estaba trabajando en la modernización de datos, o sea, en lo que es el mapeo de, de datos por, con los datos de modelo de datos de la OMA, ¿sí? y Brasil, digamos, hace la, la propuesta de implementar una red blockchain. Esa propuesta se eleva a la comisión técnica en Mercosur, el Mercosur que se hace periódicamente y ahí es cuando se llega a un consenso y se aprueba. Eso eh, ya fue en el año 2017, 2018. Eso fue, digamos, progresando hasta que en el año 2020 se diseña la red blockchain eh, haciendo las dos redes, como dije eh, anteriormente, eh, la red de testing y la red de producción. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Emmanuel and uh, Oslam uh, to address some other questions that, uh, that were posed. 
uh, one of the questions is, are there pilots running in cooperation with big industry players, such as uh, Amazon, TradeLens, uh, et cetera? And well, I'll leave that one uh, for the two of you right now. The other one just kind of escaped me here, but we'll circle back to that. Uh, Emmanuel or, or Aslam? Sure, I'm happy to jump in that one. Um, yes, there are, there are some uh, interesting pilots that are conducted uh, jointly with the private sector. You mentioned Trade Lens, and uh, this is also um, uh, a uh, an initiative that was mentioned by, by one of the speakers. Um, there are more than a, a dozen, if not even more, about 20, I think, customs authorities that participate in the Train Lens project uh, and that are piloting it. So uh, close cooperation uh, between some uh, some private sector initiatives and, and customs. Uh, for Amazon uh, as such, I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell, um, but I do know that customs authorities are involved in, in other projects on the private sector side, uh, in particular when it comes to, uh, to blockchain. Um, I see that uh, the speaker from Argentina actually has his hand raised, so he may want to uh, to share some insights as well. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, Argentina, please go ahead. Sí, buenas tardes. Quería dar una especificación con respecto a lo que había dicho anteriormente. Sí, que más allá del consenso que eh, se ha celebrado el año 2017 y 2018. La puesta en producción entre Argentina y Brasil se, eh, se realiza en, el, o sea, en, en este año, en el mes de abril. Ese detalle solamente. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we did have uh, an interesting question from uh, one participant that asks, has any country implemented AI or machine learning specifically for customs valuation risk assessment? Um, what external data sources are available for valuation risk identification? That, that, that's a huge question right there, but I think if we address the first part, um, maybe Oslim and Emmanuel, as the two principal authors behind the report, uh, could, could share any experience in, in, in that area. Uh, Emmanuel or uh, Oslo? Yeah, I can jump in. <laughs> I don't know whether Oslo wants to say a few words, but if, if not, so let me let me jump in on that. Um, I, I was actually uh, looking at the the detailed answers uh, of the the two reports that we published recently. Uh, so AI is used for uh, risk assessment, risk management, and we have two case studies from Brazil and uh, and the Russian Federation in the in the latest report, the study report. Uh, whether it's specifically for customs valuation, it's actually not mentioned in the report. So I guess we would have to go back uh, to uh, to these authorities to to check. Um, but as a matter as in a general manner, I would say, uh, there are several um, several projects that use AI for risk management and, and risk assessment. Thank you, Emmanuel. Indeed, uh, as Emmanuel explained, uh, we don't have a specific use case on uh, valuation uh, area. But uh, in general, there was also another question from another member asking if it is possible to share uh, the, the technologies used or uh, developed by other members with them uh, in the chat box. Indeed, uh, this is uh, one of the targets, one of the aims of this, one of the objective of this study report. Uh, we would like to um, share the uh, use cases, case studies from uh, our members with uh, all uh, customs administrations, as well as with private sector and with traders as well, because we believe uh, we believe the importance of the sharing uh, knowledge and sharing experiences. That's why we specifically have 42 case studies in the second part of the study report. But in addition to that, if you go through the report in each part uh, of the report, I mean, under each seven technologies, you will see some uh, examples, you will see some implementation by either customs administrations or other government agencies uh, regarding the implementation of these technologies in their uh, administration's countries. Regarding again sharing information and uh, how as WCO uh, we support our members regarding the implementation of uh, these 
uh, technologies. Um, indeed, uh, during the last two years, I mean, since uh, 2021, we have uh, conducted four regional workshops uh, and we covered uh, five, of, uh, five out of six WCO regions with these workshops. And then uh, we have one more uh, workshop planned for the current financial year. And the aim and the target of these workshops uh, is raising the awareness among customs administrations uh, regarding the implementation of these uh, disruptive technologies, as well as sharing the experiences uh, with these uh, administrations. Sometimes we invite uh, the, the members from other regions as well uh, to share the experiences with uh, other parts of the world, let's say. Um, this is what we do in terms of uh, supporting our members uh, regarding the implementation of these this technologies. Of course, as mentioned a few times, uh, WCO Technology Conference is also another huge opportunity for us for sharing uh, the experience and supporting our members regarding the implementation of technologies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel and Oslam, for uh, jumping in there. Uh, we do have uh, another question for Korea, and it asks, which skills of big data analysis is Korea Customs adapting or utilizing so far? Korea? Okay, thank you. So we are using the lots of skills. Uh, I already mentioned there are some kind of prediction, uh, regression, clustering, pattern recognition, and time series analysis. So we also using the lots of open sources, and we uh, decided which is the correct and the right skills. Uh, depends on the models because we already developed lots of models. So we using the lots of uh, different uh, big data models. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And uh, Norbert, one more question for uh, Dutch Customs here. It asks, do you have any quantitative and qualitative feedback on the efficiency of the predictive analysis you implemented? Robert? Uh, yes, uh, we do uh, measure uh, the effectiveness of our models, and we have to do that also uh, by law, but, but, but for the model. And, and that was already the case when we used rule-based algorithms. And the way we do that is we run parallel, always also random checks. And we compare the, uh, the, the hit rate of the alerts from the risk profiles and the AI models with the random checks we do. So that's how we uh, how we measure the efficiency or the effectiveness, I should probably say, about uh, from um, our models. And if we have a new model, before we launch it into production, uh, we do the same uh, in, in a shadow. Um, I mentioned this shadow runs. So we have trained a model. We think it's good. Uh, we apply it. Uh, and we, uh, we we do random checks and we and we compare the two. So that's how we uh, do that. And it's important. It's it's a I would say a baseline of justifying that that your models are working. How can you otherwise justify that you uh, find somebody based on a suspicion from a model if the model is not? So you cannot prove the model is um, uh, yeah correct and and reliable. Thank you very much. Uh, here's a, a question uh, that I'll put out there um, from one of the participants. It says, in the brave new world of AI, blockchain, machine learning, et cetera, does customs still see a role of the port community systems as a gateway to their respective infrastructure solutions? I'm wondering if uh, any of our panelists would like to tackle that question in the approximately uh, one or two minutes that we have left here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm, I'm, I won't hijack the speaking time, but this is, uh, uh, yes, there's definitely the role. Uh, a port community system, uh, the way I see it are um, supporting the, 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 to optimize the flow in a port 
So they collect all kinds of data, detailed data about the operation in the port. That, that includes gate in, gate out. Uh, that includes uh, all kinds of, of uh, so the, the, uh, what the terminals, the, the, the containers, when they arrive at the terminal, when they leave, when they are on the ship, how long they were in the key, if there's been stuff put in, all, all kind of detailed information. And they are connected usually to the advanced ones, in at least the ones I know, are connected to the to large back offices, um, their shippers, uh, their logistic players to coordinate the work in the port. So they that's how the port community systems can be a portal to collect data from the people and the organizations they are connected to. And I know from Port Base and, and uh, the Port Community System in Marseille and in Barcelona, uh, they're all very well connected to a huge group of uh, players and that they all have valuable information for customs organizations that we can use to do the risk management um, and to uh, build AI models or rules-based algorithms. And in return, try to facilitate um, those organizations who are transparent. Long sentence, but uh, uh, important topic, I think. No, thank you very much. Uh, greatly appreciate uh, your insights uh, on that question. Um, this does bring us to the end of our, our webinar. And uh, I would like to thank uh, all of our distinguished speakers, the WCO Secretary General, Dr. Mikuria, the WTO Director General, Dr. Okonjo Iwela, our colleagues, Emmanuel, Gaon and Oslam Soisanli, uh, and uh, of course our distinguished uh, panelists from Argentina, Korea, Niger, and the Netherlands. Thank you all so much for uh, your contributions. The finalization of the study report was made possible thanks to the contributions and support from the WCO and WTO secretariats, working closely with member customs administrations, set the private sector representatives and other stakeholders. We are also very grateful to the Korea Customs Cooperation Fund uh, for funding the design and the printing of this publication in three languages. The study report intends to further raise the awareness and knowledge of, w, uh, of WCO and WTO members of the use of disruptive technologies in international trade, and particularly in the border management environment, including the benefits and opportunities and the challenges and gaps identified. The study report will remain a living document intended to contribute to well-informed decisions, to decision-making uh, in this area. A final thank you to our interpreters and to our technical staff, without whom this would not have been possible. I wish you a very pleasant rest of your day and goodbye from Brussels. Thank you so much for joining us.